Hello and welcome to this Rattle and Hum Sports Spreecast. I'm Brian Houston. It's the SEC report coming up for week seven, and we have got a huge amount of uh, information to deal with today, uh, not only with games, but also with uh, individual items. And joining us, as always, to uh, visit about all the things that have gone on this week in the Southeastern Conference is the author of Gumbo for the Tiger's Soul, and that is Cess Guerra. And Cess, if you can stick your earbuds in, that would help because I'm getting a, an echo there. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay. All right. Uh, Cess, let's talk first of all. Get ready to. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. How's that going? How's that sound? We just need to get the uh, we need to get the earbuds in so your, your echo will go away. Oh shucks. That's okay. We'll we'll take him off camera for just a moment and uh, get him ready to go, and then we'll come back to him as we uh, again have a huge week uh, topped off by the uh, resignation of Steve Spurrier, uh, the season-ending injury to Nick Chubb, the Georgia running back. Will Greer being suspended, uh, the Florida quarterback, uh, uh, right here uh, just a few days before Florida takes on LSU. Uh, we've got a massive game uh, this weekend at College Station with Alabama taking on Texas A&M. And so we're going to go back to uh, Sess and see what uh, the situation is there, and we'll bring him on and visit about all these things and some of the big ball games that took place last week. All right, Sess, how you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, sorry about that. Um... Oh, no problem. Just uh, li live TV always brings some uh, additional uh, caveats to the to the show. But yeah, it was an incredible weekend, and and uh, the aftermath was uh, was incredible as well. Monday was just uh, um, a, a bizarre day in the world of college football. But um, yeah, let's talk about Saturday first. All right. Well, first of all, let's see. Uh, part of that has to do with what happened on Monday. And so I guess the thing we should talk about first is the um, LSU South Carolina game. My son went to that ball game and said it was one of the most bizarre situations he's ever seen in that there were only 40,000 people there at Tiger Stadium. Uh, LSU basically played it as a road game. They played the alma mater, the band did. They played the, the uh, South Carolina fought, fight song. They held uh, tailgate parties for South Carolina, and then they put an old-fashioned beat down on uh, South Carolina when it was all said and done. Did you get to go to that game? No, I, I didn't. I, I was here in Houston uh, just uh, working my real estate business, helping some clients out on Saturday, and um, I did get to watch it on DVR and um, got to see what, what everybody else did as well, which was uh, a little bit of a tight game there in the in the first half. Um, South Carolina sold out for the run, and then uh, in, the, in the second half, LSU just wore them out. Once but, again, we uh, saw yeah, a little... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Once again, we saw Leonard Fournette put on a show. Uh, he didn't do what he's done the previous three games, rushing for uh, 200 yards, and it looked like uh, he may, may have been on a pitch count this past weekend, which I thought was kind of interesting, considering that he wasn't on a pitch count the previous week against somebody like uh, like an Eastern Michigan. But in this particular ball game, uh, he was used fairly sparingly in the game. Still had a huge run. Still did nothing to uh, diminish his Heisman. Uh, leadership at this point, I would say, but uh, I did I did think it was kind of interesting the way he was used in the ball game. Not complaining, but very much uh, interesting approach. Oh, the fans are never satisfied, never satisfied. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, um, I know one. Yeah, you know that picture that you had posted just a, a second ago. I think uh, maybe a. Uh, a very key play in this entire season, uh, especially as it relates to uh, Leonard Fournette. And that was uh, the, the play where um, Harris hit the fullback Moore out of the uh, backfield and Moore sustained a, a left knee injury on that play that you just had uh, on the photo. And of course, we all know that Moore is Fournette's guy and his lead blocker. And when they run in the two back set, uh, it's an incredible combination. Um, yeah, that one, that one right there. He, uh, that's the play in which he got hurt, 
and uh, I know they're going to hold him out this week and um, and probably next week against uh, Western. Con- uh, go ahead. Yeah, I saw where he is apparently out. He's apparently out three to four weeks now with the knee injury, according to uh, NOLA.com. Right. Hopefully it's it's not a major injury that requires surgery, and maybe he can be back for the Alabama game on November 7th. So that gives him uh, almost a, a month to kind of uh, recuperate a little bit and, and rehab. So uh, overall, what did you think of the Tigers' performance? I did think that uh, Brandon Harris had his best game of the season in that ball game, and, and that's one of the things that has uh, concerned Tiger fans all along is, is Harris going to step up and be, a, be the kind of quarterback that can win a ball game for you if the running game gets slowed down by any stretch. That's right. Uh, I think that um, we opened it up for the first time in uh, uh, th- this season, and uh, Brandon Harris showed a, a great arm. He throws a beautiful ball, uh, and I think he's getting a little bit more comfortable now. He's got uh, five starts this season, and uh, got a lot of playing time and have seen lots of different coverages and, and blitzes. And, and uh, you know, I, I think he's, he's starting to, to come into his own. South Carolina doesn't have what is widely regarded as a, a, a top-tier secondary or defense, and, and uh, they've been exposed throughout the year. And, and so Brandon Harris took advantage of that as well. But hopefully uh, it's a, a good sign of things to come, and, and we'll definitely see this coming week against Florida, which is uh, claiming to be DBU taking our place as well. So they've got a great secondary, and we'll give Brandon Harris a chance to, to shine again. Well, we shall see about DBU uh, when it comes up. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, it was a big win for the Tigers. Uh, it was, uh, under, again, very bizarre circumstances, uh, very quiet stadium. You know, it, uh, the way the thing broke yeah. out, uh, finding out in the middle of the week, really late Wednesday, that they were actually going to play the game in Baton Rouge. Uh, and then you take into account the fact that you've got 74,000 season ticket holders. So those tickets are not open for sale on the open market. So that really limited the opportunities to put people in the seats uh, the students were planning to go elsewhere. My son was at the game. Uh, he's an LSU student, but he said the uh, student body, really there were only about 5,000 students at the ball game. It was just a very bizarre atmosphere, but one that uh, you had to tip the cap to uh, LSU for taking care of business in that game. Yes, they did. Um, you know, because of, of all the the different uh, emotions that were, were uh, surrounding that game, uh, there could have easily been an opportunity to let down, and uh, the Tigers didn't. Uh, it was, it, like you say, it was a bizarre uh, game, a bizarre atmosphere and environment. But LSU got a lot of kudos, a lot of great national um, exposure and publicity. And uh, uh, as the game turned out, uh, we, we really uh, ended up dominating uh, South Carolina, which was uh, a great outcome for the Tigers. I said that uh, we one of the guys that we did get to see was Darius Geis, who uh, she outrushed Fournette in the ball game, and uh, apparently he's got a little something to his game as well. He looked fantastic. Been high course, on Darius Geis. Uh, having to refresh at this moment, so we are going to uh, bring him back on in just a second. Geis was terrific in the ball game, rushed for over 150 yards, uh, and so LSU goes to five and zero on the game. The uh, other big big uh, news of the week had to do with the uh, retirement, resigning, or whatever you want to call it, of uh, one Steve Spurrier. Spurrier announced his uh, resignation uh, a couple of days ago, and so, Seth, I want to get your reaction to that. This following the LSU loss, uh, I I think it surprised everybody that uh, he quit right there in the middle of the season.
Okay, we're back. And uh, again, Steve Spurrier uh, announcing his resignation uh, on that Monday, uh, really a bit of a surprise and that uh, he was, uh, he caught everybody off guard by that. But that's kind of the way Steve Spurrier works. He does tend to uh, catch you off guard. He always does the unpredictable. Uh, even in quitting a, a job, he seems to do the unpredictable. And that's what apparently was the case here. Uh, what, were your, what was your reaction when you learned that Steve Spurrier had announced his resignation, Seth? I saw the alerts coming on uh, on Sunday night, and uh, you know there were questions about uh, Spurrier's longevity going into the season, and uh, the season was really uh, going into a tailspin, um, and, and uh, the beatdown that LSU put put on South Carolina really, I guess, sent uh, Coach Spurrier, the old ball coach, over the top. So um, I. I I kind of like it. I think it was refreshing, refreshing to see him um, end his stint there at South Carolina the way he did, as opposed to some coaches that hang on just way too long, uh, a.k.a. Um, um, Joe Paterno, uh, maybe even Bobby Bowden. Uh, when the coaches hang on too long, it just becomes controversial. Uh, and the uh, the uh, departure or the separation between the parties that the coach and the university gets a little messy. So um, and you can even say uh, um, that when um, Bear Bryant separated from uh, Alabama back in 1982 and the beginning of 1983, that was also, you know, one where, uh, you know, the, the coach just hung around a little bit too long. But Spurrier, well, uh, yeah, but Spurrier uh, just ended it. He just uh, took responsibility and said that, you know, his time had come and, you know, give somebody else a chance. And I really like that. Well, one thing about it, he's going to go down as one of the uh, top two or three coaches in the history of the game, at least in this modern era. Uh, you know, Bear Bryant, obviously the greatest coach in the SEC and then maybe there's an argument between uh, Spurrier and Saban as to who's number two. But uh, uh, no question of the impact he made. I do find it interesting that uh, he leaves as a lovable character. But back when he was uh, at Florida and putting 65 to nothing whoopings on people, he, he wasn't so liked back in those days. Oh, I remember uh, the different different names uh, like Moamar Spurrier <laughs> and the college football terrorist. And and uh, yeah, those those uh, names were going around back in the in the mid 90s when he was just terrorizing all of college football and. And yeah, uh, he leaves as a lovable character and just always well known for uh, the, the one liners and the quotes and, and the stories. So, yeah, um, he's going to be sorely missed, but uh, just really uh, enjoyed and appreciated the way he separated from uh, what looked like uh, was really going to be a bad season into who knows what's going to happen now. If the, the players will kind of unite and. Uh, and, and have a an upswing or an uptick for the for the rest of the season. Okay, we're going to have to uh, kind of briefly rush through last week. Oh my, okay, I'm having all kinds of issues here today, so I apologize. Um, but the bottom line is, we've got to rush through some of these games and talk about some of the uh, things that took place last week. And I can't get my computer to control itself, so here we go. All right, Steve uh, says we had Tennessee knocking off Georgia and a heartbreaking injury for Nick Chubb out for the year uh, with a knee injury. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the outcome of the ball game and the loss of Chubb and what that means to the Bulldogs going forward. Yeah, devastating injury, uh, second year in a row. Last year it was Todd Worley, uh, and with uh, Nick Chubb uh, coming in to replace him, we'll see how well the, uh, the substitute for, um, for Nick Chubb does. But, yeah, just a devastating loss. Uh, I think it, it uh, was, was it the very first play of the game for Georgia? Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, they, they seem to kind of uh, continue on with the game plan and uh, had a, a nice lead on Tennessee, but uh, credit to Tennessee for coming back and and uh, taking one from the uh, the jaws of, of defeat, uh, which has happened to them so often. And, and they've... Uh, Maybe have turned the corner finally. We'll see uh, 
Um, let's see. Tennessee plays um, is off this week before at, facing Alabama the following week at Bama. So we'll we'll see how far Tennessee has come along when they take uh, take on Alabama after uh, Bama's game at College Station. So we'll see. That's going to be very interesting. And, and the one question I have is, what do you think about the uh, smoky uniforms for Tennessee? I liked it. I, I think it's a it's a it's a cool look. Uh, had no problem with it. It was uh, really, really uh, a, a good look for the Volunteers. Okay, fair enough. I'm, I'm <laughs> of the, all the crazy combinations that people come up with. Uh, that one bothered me the least. Wasn't real excited about LSU's look the other day, but that's just me. I'm, I'm a traditionalist. Uh, I like to leave things <laughs> alone. But uh, anyway, moving forward, uh, Arkansas loses to Alabama. A uh, little uh, acting going on there as uh, we saw <laughs> we saw Brett Bielema do a flop to get an unsportsmanlike conduct call against Alabama. Uh, this guy, is a, he's a piece of work, isn't he? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, if, if I was a head coach in the SEC or anywhere uh, that was recruiting against uh, Brett Bielema, uh, I'd put that little video on my iPhone, and whenever I was in the uh, recruit's house, I'd show that and ask the question, do you want to play for a coach that has to resort to those tactics to uh, influence the outcome of a game? I mean, I thought it was immature and yeah, bush league. Um, it's, and, it's interesting uh, the way uh, he, he operates, but, uh, he, you know, again, he, he has a pretty good solid program, but uh, that was pretty different. I hadn't seen one like that before. And, you know, to Saban's credit, Saban said, hey, look, you know, our guy retaliated. When you retaliate, you're going to get the penalty flag. That's all I saw, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Yeah, well, uh, I think he took the high road, but uh, I still got to say that was really a Bush League move from what uh, appears to be a Bush League coach. Okay, strong comments. All right, uh, we also saw this week the, the uh, suspension of Will Greer, the Florida quarterback, that was a major stunner here as, they, uh, as Florida gets ready to uh, battle LSU and Baton Rouge in a uh, contest between two top ten teams, Florida rated eighth and LSU sixth in some polls. Uh, how big of a hit is that going to be for the Florida Gators losing their starting quarterback, Will Greer? Well, I've seen the statistics side by side uh, on uh, Trayon Harris and Will Greer. Um, uh, Greer is is uh, head and shoulders um, more productive than uh, Harris, uh, Trayon Harris, that is. And so uh, we'll see how that translates uh, into the game on Saturday. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Florida was on the upswing. Uh, they had just had a, a major victory the week before uh, and then um, – uh, came back and, and took care of business against Missouri, and then all of a sudden, starting quarterback gets suspended for a year. But that is under appeal. We'll see how that plays out. But uh, he's not playing on Saturday. And, um, you know, uh, for the fourth time this season, LSU's facing a, a second string or a backup quarterback. Amazing. It's, uh, it's pretty strange, and it kind of leads you to wonder what kind of a year uh, LSU is going to have when you have – so many of these kinds of things falling into place for them, uh, not to take anything away from the players that they've played against, but but uh, they have caught a break or two with the schedule change last week with these quarterback issues coming up. Uh, so we'll see. But I will say this, regardless of who plays quarterback, Florida plays some terrific defense, and you're going to find out something about whether LSU is balanced enough to win a ball game if someone with a legitimate defense can come up and, and slow down the running game. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, Florida's defense is just nasty and just uh, very tough against the, the run. Uh, their secondary is is an elite secondary. Um, you know, often call, oftentimes called DBUE, uh, being the East. And so uh, we'll see. It's going to be a very intriguing matchup. Uh, it's going to be one in the trenches, and uh, and we'll see who gets the be the better end of that in, in the uh, over the long haul. Uh, I think it's a it's going to be a great test for the Tigers, but uh, good uh, that we have it at home this year. All right, and if you had to make a pick on this right now, what would you pick? Uh, I'm going to pick the Tigers to win. I think the uh, the advantage goes to the LSU defense versus the uh, Florida offense. 
and uh, we've got enough offense firepower to uh, put some points on the board. So uh, I'm going to go with the, the Tigers to, to pull this one out. All right. Uh, anything else from last week that caught your eye? Uh, in the SEC, uh, I think Ole Miss took care of business. A&M was off. Uh, getting rested for um, for uh, the the Crimson Tide rolling into College Station, um, you know. So they've got a week of rest. Alabama off of a tough battle against Arkansas. Uh, I still um, uh, I'm kind of unsure about how that one's going to go, um, but uh, A and M obviously going to have a big home field advantage. But I think Alabama is going to win it. See, this is one that really, really intrigues me, Seth, because this ball game, uh, wow, uh, you've got such a high-powered offense, uh, and not only are they high-powered A&M, high-powered in the passing game, but now they've found a running game to go along with it. Uh, Trey Carson has 430 yards rushing. He's not Derrick Henry by any means, but but for A&M to have a running game like that uh, really starts to uh, give, you, give you fits on the defensive end, trying to figure out how to slow them down when you have a guy as, as proficient as Kyle Allen is, 13 touchdowns and two picks so far this season. Uh, and they're going to run the up-tempo offense to go along with it, and that's always given uh, Alabama difficulty. Uh, so uh, just as uh, Ole Miss gave them difficulty earlier this year. So I- I'm really intrigued to see uh, how Alabama responds to dealing with an offense that's probably the best offense they've seen this year. Yeah, I hope I get to watch that game. I'll be on campus at, in Baton Rouge. And uh, I'll try to find my way to a, a TV and watch that, that early game and, uh, and see as much of it as I can. Um, but uh, I, I think that Alabama is going to rely on its power running game, keep A&M offense off the field as much as possible. Uh, it could come down to, to the turnover matchup again. So uh, we'll see how that goes. And um, yeah, I'm going to give my – yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give the edge to Alabama, but I, I would not be surprised to see A&M win. If A&M does win, that's two losses in the SEC West for, for Alabama, and it's going to be seriously, seriously uh, impede their uh, national championship and SEC title hopes. And oh, by the way, don't let that 59 nothing beat down that Alabama put on uh, A&M last year mean anything this year this is a totally different a&m team totally different uh you know just the experience at the quarterback position now and uh new defensive coordinator have kind of changed things around but uh i don't think a&m has faced anybody like uh like alabama uh this year maybe a little bit of arkansas gave them a taste of it but uh, i don't i don't put arkansas in in Al- at alabama's uh, uh level at this point in time and hey, we can give uh, the uh, A and M fans something to sweat about too, since the uh, since Steve Sarkeesian has been fired at USC. Uh, there was a time when Kevin Sumlin was considered a a very top prospect for that USC job, and uh, certainly looks like that could be a case again where somebody might be coming after Kevin Sumlin. Wow, I mean, this is going to be a very, very interesting uh, coaching carousel season, and uh, maybe we we ought to devote one show to the coaching carousel at the end of the year. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, yeah, both both USC's East and West have openings, um, so they're going to be pulling in. Who knows? Uh, NFL coordinators. Uh, top assistant, top flight assistants, or even uh, head coaches have been known to ch- uh, change from one conference to the other. Like uh, Coach Bielema went from uh, Wisconsin down to Arkansas, um, and uh, co- Coach uh, Mark D'Antonio uh, is a graduate of South Carolina. So uh, who knows how this is all going to play out? But um, uh, I, I think Sumlin has everything he needs in terms of salary and facilities and a, a recruiting coaching, um, a recruiting uh, hotbed. So uh, I don't know what it would take to get him out of uh, College Station. Well, I will say this, uh, he could, and this will be an insult to people from the Pac-12, but uh, he'd be going into a much easier conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think you're you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, there there's uh, upticks uh, from some of the teams from time to time. Utah this year, Oregon will be back. Uh, USC, UCLA, 
the Arizona schools, you know, Stanford, uh, they always have their ups and downs, uh, but not consistently, consistently top tier uh, teams. So, uh, yeah, I, I would agree with you that the Pac-12 uh, is, is a little bit easier to deal with. Yeah, and again, that's that's uh, probably a slap at the Pac-12. They're a good conference, but I'm telling you, just getting out of the SEC West may be motivation enough for a coach to leave the conference, uh, especially if you can get the you're in a recruiting base like Los Angeles. Uh, you know, someone probably could mop up there just like he has in this area. So, right. all right, uh, we have looking at the rest of the schedule, uh, the rest of the SEC schedule. There there are only a, a couple of games beyond Alabama, Texas A&M. And Florida LSU. And by the way, uh, looking at the, a, a tweet that Paul Feinbaum sent out, this is the first time in four years that uh, the SEC has two games featuring uh, two top ten teams against each other. The Alabama A&M team, uh, game, both teams ranked in the top ten. Again, the Florida LSU, both ranked in the top ten. Uh, the other game, uh, interesting game, I think, is Missouri at Georgia. Georgia is basically done in the East now with two losses. But they can definitely create some problems for a team like Missouri that still has a shot, I guess. Uh, right. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, Georgia has two losses. But remember, one of those losses was uh, to uh, Alabama in the West. So um, uh, theoretically, if they win out, they, they still have a shot uh, by taking out uh, Georgia would have to take out Missouri, Florida, Kentucky, uh, Auburn. And uh, and still have a hope uh, of winning the East. So there, uh, all is not lost for Georgia yet because of the the split losses from West to East. Uh, unlike Alabama, if they were to lose to A and M, two losses in the SEC West, and that kind of uh, cooks the goose for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Missouri also with two losses. But again, as you say, there's still so much of the season to play out, uh, and you wonder, you know, how Florida is going to deal with their schedule going forward. Uh, without Will Greer. Uh, the other surprise team in this conference, I have to say, is Kentucky with a 4-1 mark, 2-1 uh, and one in conference play. Uh, and again, they play this week at home on a Thursday night against Auburn. Uh, suddenly, uh, Mark Stoops has done a heck of a job there. Yeah, I think Commonwealth Stadium is going to be rocking tomorrow night. And uh, we'll see. Uh, Auburn seems to be down. And um you know, I uh, I'm predicting Kentucky to win this game, so uh, we we'll see. And if they do, um, the the rest of their schedule plays out, uh, you know, fairly good for them at Mississippi State, uh, Tennessee at home, Georgia on the road. So, uh, you know, um, I, I think they've got a chance if they if they beat Auburn tomorrow, we'll, we'll really see a, a good measuring stick for what uh, Kentucky's made of this year. Well, they, they've been impressive so far. Granted, uh, not a super tough non-conference schedule, but uh, again, getting the job done. And so the boys in blue uh, seem to have it rolling right now, and we'll see what the, what it matters that they'll be playing at home against Auburn tomorrow night. It should be a great atmosphere for that ball game. Uh, Vandy and South Carolina, their seasons are pretty much done, so I don't even want to get into that game too much. Um, Thank let's you. talk a little bit about what's <laughs> going on with Gumbo. <laughs> What's going on with Gumbo for the Tiger Soul? Well, we had a great uh, book signing event last week. Uh, lots of fans came out at uh, the Hollister Grill here in in Houston, and uh, really pushing that uh, that holiday push for for fans to get a copy of the book and and um, connect with me in some way or another. I'd be happy to to personalize the book for a, a loved one, immediate uh, family. A member or friend and uh, still uh, connecting with a lot of new people and, and having fun. Uh, you know, lots of great recipes for uh, the cooks in your family and and uh, lots of great stories, too. So uh, we're, we're getting a, a last good run of it this year and, and uh, still having lots of fun. So it's it's been great. All right. I have to ask one last question before we let you run. What do you think about Leonard Fournette being on the cover of Sports Illustrated this week? Bother you, worry you, concern you at all? No, no, we've uh, we, we've uh, you know gone through that before. I think we had uh, oh, who was the running back, uh, Michael, um, who was on the cover of the uh, Sports Illustrated the year we uh, we beat Oregon. Let me see, I've got it right back there. You'll see it. It's um, number forty-two. Oh, his name slips my mind. Good grief. 
<laughs> oh, this is total live TV. Michael Ford. There you go. <laughs> yeah, total Michael live Ford. Television. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just, I just had to go peek. Uh, yeah, that's the last time uh, uh, an LSU running back was on the uh, the cover of Sports Illustrated. That was at the beginning of the season when LSU beat uh, Oregon. And uh, of course, you remember we went on to have just a spectacular year that year, uh, going. Uh, 13 and 0 in uh, in conference the SEC championship game, but uh, coming up a little short at the end. But uh, no uh, no no superstitions on my end. Uh, I think it's great exposure for LSU and for uh, Leonard Fournette's uh, Heisman uh, Trophy hopes. Well, it's going to be a great weekend for college football. Again, two fantastic ball games this week in the SEC. And uh, Seth, we'll look forward to talking to you next week. And uh, kind of breaking it all down, and hopefully we won't have so much off the field news to deal with, with uh, <laughs> coaches resigning and players getting suspended and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it's a whole new world in the college football coaching uh, world. I mean, they're making so much money, there's so much pressure to win, and um, don't be surprised. Uh, there, there's uh, going to be another handful of of openings before the uh, the end of the year, I think. No question, always happens. Seth, thanks very much for coming on with us today. We really appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you. Talk to you next week. All right. Seth Guerra, author of Gumbo for the Tiger's Soul. I'm Brian Houston. Thanks very much for watching this SEC report on Spreecast. You can check out this and other Spreecast broadcasts on Rattle and Hum Sports, the website. That's www.rnhsports.com. Thanks very much for watching today. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you next week.